your lap. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, well, before we get started, we have any prayers, praises, any news that we need to make available to the group? Uh, Y'all may not know, Donald Yates has pneumonia, uh, and Charlotte uh, has been able to be able to go to the hospital. She said, Jack, from what I heard, somebody told me this. Uh, she was actually able to hug him. Uh, Is he in the hospital then? They took him. I don't know if he's back back at the league yet or not, but he did go to the hospital. She ain't got to touch him in a long time. Yeah. yeah. It's hard enough under normal circumstances. I can't imagine. Anyway, I hope that um, sometimes when something is as ongoing and as consistent as this, I hate to say it, but as humans, um, it tends to slip our mind. Um, I hope that you will keep Charlotte and Don consistently in your prayers. I know that I'm ashamed to admit it, but sometimes I forget just because it's ongoing. Um, but that is really a need to be sure. There is a man who's attended here for the last two Sundays, Jim Cable. Mm -hmm. He used to go to Bonsai. He and his wife would come. And he had a hip operation on Thursday. Hmm. He supposed to have left the hospital either that night or the morning. And he developed some complications. In fact, they thought that he coded, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But he stayed in the hospital, and hopefully he will go home today. Yeah, absolutely. They put me a hip in, and when they moved me back to recovery, well, it moved me, I'm assuming. It popped out. They uh, picked him up under his shoulders and knees to put him over the bed, separated the hip, had to do the surgery over. And I couldn't do it till that night, that before OR room come open, so I was in oh, some I'll kind bet. of I'll misery. I'll bet. Mm. And doctor said it's my fault that it popped out, didn't it? Yeah. I had physical oh, therapy. Your fault. Yeah. yeah, of course. It's my fault, and they I was... Said, I wasn't even conscious. What'd you he do? said, you, you sat straight up in the bed and dislocated that. He was unconscious. <laughs> he didn't sit up. I had, I had physical therapy after my hip, and she would have she would take my leg and pull it as far out as she could. And I told her, I said, that hurts. She said, Pull it out of out yeah, of joint. Yeah, that hurts. She said, just hold it. She you gotta hold it for She pulled seconds. it too hard, what she done? I told the doctor that and he went, you very fortunate she didn't pop that right Absolutely. out of right the socket. There, it's, it's, just, it's sitting there when they first do it. Nothing's holding it in until it heals and, and ligaments and stuff stretch up. It That's silly. That's plum silly. Well, another, another thing she had me doing was, was, was lying that. there and pressing <laughs> up that bench with a lot of weight. And I, I couldn't even lift it up. Too much? I can't do this. And she went, oh yeah, you can. Come on, let's see you do it. And I can't do it. I'm telling you, I'm not a baby. When they put mine in, they wanted me to go to therapy. I said, go. I'll do mine. Yeah. Yeah. And seven days after I had my hip put in, I went back to work. Yes. You hard-headed, Dave. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I thought David was hard-headed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it your hip or your back when you fell off the paint can? I don't remember that. They did. Either when they fused his back. The first one or when they done his hip, he was supposed to be doing nothing. And so I was staying off work, take care of him. He's like, You go back to work, I'm fine. I'll stay right here in this chair. So I put everything yeah, on the table. Sure. So come home that evening. He is standing on a paint can, painting over his head. <laughs> and I go, What are you doing? And he falls off the paint can. <laughs> so it was your fault, Joanne. It was your fault. It was. Okay, now let's talk about Brian. <laughs> hey Brian, we're talking about you now. It's all been said. It's all been said. The so, day after I come home from my hip, putting the hip in, I went out trying to figure, well, I'd like to have me a picnic place right here. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of bras and smokes yeah. and everything right there. Where I, I wanted to be bending over. I didn't bend over. I took 
I saw reciprocating so battery yeah. operated and started clearing them. Cut them out. Cleared it out and built a picnic table. Gotta bend right. over to handle that reciprocating saw. Yeah. He's got one, I know. Uh -huh. Yeah. You guys you guys think you can snow us, believe me. <laughs> okay, the conversation is going down a road that we don't want to go. So let let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> <laughs> for all of us, Amen. and um, we'll, we'll pray that we get better sense when we go. <laughs> yeah. Especially for the human. Do you hear it, Brian? Amen. I'm praying on this dumb stuff these old fellas do when they get surgery. Yeah. 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 We'll be boys. <laughs> like the cords on his bed. Yeah. Uh -huh. Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. Um, those of us who are here and those of us <clears throat> Uh, who are watching elsewhere. Uh, we appreciate the technology that allows us to reach out um, to people at a time like this or uh, to people that are injured or hospital bound. Uh, anyone that wants to uh, connect uh, can. We pray for those in need and we know there are many, many more than um, the folks that we have mentioned in this group. In fact, we prayerfully lift up the entire world. That's a big prayer, but of course you're in control of what's going on, and sometimes we don't understand it. Uh, maybe most times we don't understand it. And in our limited vision, uh, there are things that we certainly do not approve of. But all that being said, there's nothing that surprises you, and nothing that's beyond your control or outside your plan. So uh, we ask you to help us to patiently accept and to do what you call on us to do in our limited way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, we have been talking about the events, at least the ones that we know of, in Jesus' life and what they, they mean for us. And the reason that we mentioned right to begin with this was important is because if Jesus could have fulfilled everything he needed to do or agreed to do uh, remember we talked about the um, covenant of redemption if he was able just to come down on Friday get arrested be crucified be raised on Sunday and go home and it was all done that's what he would have done but the reason that we're told about the life of Jesus, particularly his ministry, excuse me, is because his ministry and the things that he did and the things that he went through are relevant to our salvation or that plan of redemption. And today we're going to talk about baptism in general and the baptism of Christ in specific. Now, when John the Baptist showed up on the Jordan River in the wilderness baptizing folks, he was doing something that was radical. Uh, why was it radical? Well, for one thing, there had not been the sound of a prophet's voice in that area for 400 years. The last prophet was Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. And for 400 years, there was silence. Now, if we read the prophets in the Old Testament, we lose the sense that there was a long period of time in between these guys and gals. Um, we read them in a bunch, and we get the idea that there was a prophet on every street corner. And that a new one came along every couple of weeks or a couple of months. That's not the way it was. 400 years is a long time. And there had been silence for 400 years. But suddenly, out of nowhere, comes a guy wearing camel hair with a leather belt. And he comes out of the desert. Now, traditionally, men that came out of the desert... That's where prophets traditionally came from. So there was a lot of excitement 
um, because the people considered John an aesthetic man. He lived very simply. He ate honey and locusts, and he was what we would later uh, in church history come to consider a monk, uh, like those guys that in the third and fourth century went out in the desert and lived in a little cave or a little hovel. That's the kind of man John was, and the people were excited. They were excited because they were expecting from Scripture a prophet to come before the Messiah. And here 400 years had gone by, the first sign of a prophet that they had seen in all that time comes out of the desert. And not only that, but he's speaking with authority. He's coming out, he's not mincing words, he's not tiptoeing around things, he's out there telling people, repent. And he didn't care who heard it, he wanted everyone to hear it. He was speaking with authority, as if it had come, which it did, from God himself. Now, the baptism that John administered to the people who came to him and asked for it was completely different than the baptism that we think of in the church today, or even the baptism that was established with the early church. It was completely different, and it was done for different reasons. Um, in the Old Testament, there were Gentiles who were called God followers. And they were Gentiles who had come to the synagogue and listened to the Jewish rabbis and had come to accept that there was one God, Yahweh. Instead of all the hundreds and thousands of gods scattered around Europe and the Near East and the Mediterranean, they had come to accept the teachings of the rabbi that there was one God. Now, unlike today, when all you have to do is say, hallelujah, and you're a Christian accepted in the church, the Jews were a little more standoffish than that. you got to prove it. you got to prove that you will believe what you believe. And they were called proselytes. And these Gentiles had to go through a whole series of training before they were able to be convert to Judaism. And part of that training or part of that process was the baptism of the proselytes. That's where the baptism came from. Now, why did these Gentiles have to go through all this, these folks? What were Gentiles to the Jews? Exactly. But both to boil it all down into one thing, they were unclean. And there's nothing that a Jew wanted less to do with than being unclean. They had 600 laws to prove it. Because they had to observe all of them to remain clean and able to go into the synagogue or the temple if they were in Jerusalem. They had to obey all those laws. And they spent time as children in school learning all those laws. And they still do, the Orthodox Jews today. And they still do. And they still do. But it's also a good indication of why Israel itself is a secular country, because they gave up on trying to follow all those laws. But the Orthodox Jews do still follow or attempt to follow all of those laws and regulations. I, I told you all this story when we were in Tampa. One of our neighbors was an Orthodox Jew, and she had locked herself in her garage Saturday night or Sunday morning, and she stayed there until Monday. She couldn't, for some what, whatever reason, she couldn't seek help. She had to, what she had done, she had to stay. Well, and they were, they are very specific. If you ever get a list of them, or maybe I'll see if I can't locate one and bring it in sometime and pass it around. Especially on the Sabbath. They are very specific on what you can and cannot do. Very specific. Uh, be that as it may, 
the Gentiles were unclean. And if you go back into uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy and read through that, you'll see how many um, laws there are about lepers and scabs and sores and touching a dead body and this, that, and the other. And the process that you had to go through to be considered cleansed and clean again so that you could mix with other Jews, let alone go to worship. <clears throat> John, by insisting that the Jews needed to be baptized and repent, what was he telling the Jews? That they weren't clean either. You are unclean. Heretofore, the only people that had to go through this process were dog, unclean, barbarian Gentiles. And John comes through and he yells out, Repent and be baptized. Be cleansed. Little wonder that the Pharisees and the temple elite they came out to see what John was up to were so mad. We're so angry. You're telling us that we are no better than the Gentiles. What a crock! They were. Abraham is our father. God, we are his chosen people. We are the center of the universe. And of course, they always and still do consider Jerusalem the center of the world. And perhaps it is. I don't know. It's God's chosen city and God's chosen people with God's chosen nation. I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. But they arrogantly believed that they were the center of the world. John's telling them you're a brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? They were, and he was told, of course, that they had no need to be cleansed, that Abraham was their father, they were the chosen people, and the fight was on. The fight was on. Between John and the religious elite and to come would be Jesus. Now who placed John in this position, the position he was in as the New Testament prophet or a New Testament prophet and was it necessary? Adrian. Did John have to do this? Was this necessary to the plan of redemption in our salvation. Well, I, we'll find, we're going to find out that yes, it was not only something that actually happened, but it was something that was necessary to the plan of redemption. The Old Testament prophets, particularly Isaiah, spoke of the coming of the Messiah and the fact that he would have a forerunner to announce him to prepare his way. John had a very simple message. It was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the prophets had spoken of the coming of the Messiah, and the people uh, longed for his arrival, at least in theory, but they had considered that it would be a long time in the future. It almost became, well, it, was, it wasn't real to them. It wasn't imminent. There was no sense of urgency. It was part of the story they were brought up on. How do I feel about it? Thank Thanks. you. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. How do we look at Revelation? Oh, it's, it's there. Yeah, it's there. But we don't need to worry about it because it ain't really coming anytime soon. But what are we told? We're told to get up and look up. When you get out of bed, you better look up. Because it may be right now. 
but we don't treat it that way. I, and, and again, I'm, I'm generalizing. Maybe everyone but me gets up every morning and looks up to see if Jesus is coming. I don't know. But we don't treat it. We treat it the same way that the Jews had come to treat the coming of the Messiah. It was something part of legend, if you will. Part of our ritual to talk about someday he will come. And this is total, has nothing to do with the lesson, but I'm just going to say, I believe that we take much as ritual, as something that we have become used to in church, uh, just like the Jews did. Just like the Jews did. Um, but here was John telling them, look, this is happening. This is happening now. Any day, this is me. I'm going to end what I'm telling you, and it's going to be here. I can only imagine what it was like to be John. Because he wasn't just saying that as part of a sermon. Like we hear, for the most part. Or at least how we receive it. He was telling them, look, I know for a fact that tomorrow may be the day that I'm down here by the Jordan River and he comes over the hill and walks down to me. Now, I don't think John expected to happen what happened, but he knew Christ was coming. Imagine what it's like to have a lifetime filled with the Holy Spirit like that. Yeah. yeah. And why was, did John have to live like that? Did he have to wear camel hair and a belt and eat honey and locusts? No. He was consumed by his mission. His only reason, now, his only reason to exist at all was to fulfill this function. His life had no other meaning. And we're told nothing about his life except when he was in his mother's womb. A lot like Christ. Exactly. Because we are only told in the Bible what is relevant to the kingdom story. We may want more information, but the information we want, we want doesn't matter. We, we, John's biography holds no relevance to the Bible and the story of the kingdom. John's only reason to exist was to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And John used some very vivid metaphors to the people that were listening. For example, Matthew 3.10, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Even now. It, you haven't seen the guy? I haven't seen the guy, but I know even now. He also talks about... Um, he who is coming after me is mightier than I. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. Those are metaphors that those people understood in that day. He was going to come, and the chaff was going to be burned. And the only thing that would be left was those worthy of him. And that's nobody. The only people that were going to be left were the people that threw themselves at his feet and hung on for dear life. John was warning the people about God, not the ritualized God that they had grown to, um, to know, but their king, their Messiah, was at the door, and they weren't ready. They weren't ready. They were unclean. This baptism that we're told about is a very important part of the redemption covenant. Now, of course, John's teaching in the power of his words had come for some to speculate that he was the Messiah because he was so powerful. He spoke so powerfully. 
But John, true to his mission, made it clear that he was not the one, that he was the forerunner, the one crying in the wilderness to make the path straight for the one who was mightier than he. On the day that Jesus arrived in the crowd, John demonstrated uh, that he meant what he said because the jo Gospel of John tells us the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The biggest problem that the Jews had with Jesus, what do you think it was? The, 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 give us some thought for a moment. John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why do you think, aside from the fact that John's been telling them that they are unclean, why do you think the Jews would have such a problem with this? For me, it would be a man claiming to be God. Okay. What, what were lambs used for? For sacrifice. Lambs were for sacrifice. And John now is saying that the Holy One of God, the one you've been expecting for eons, is a lamb? Sacrifice. They, weren't, they didn't want a lamb. They wanted a Caesar, a mighty warrior that would remove the shackles of Rome, that would make Israel a glorious nation again, like under David and Solomon. The talk of the world, the center of the universe. Man, what you, a lamb? What's a lamb going to do? A lamb is for slaughter. And why was the sacrificial system in place? take away the sins of the Jews. At least symbolically. At least temporarily. So in fact, it made sense. But the Jews remember. And this is where so much of what transpires after this makes sense. The Jews were not unclean. The Jews did not need a Messiah to cleanse them. They had a ritual system of 600-some laws to do that. They did not need a Messiah to answer for their sins because once a year, they would sacrifice a lamb and set one loose in the desert, the scapegoat, and that was taken care of. We need a king. And you may remember that centuries before, approximately 1,300 years before, the people had called out for a king. God didn't want to give them a concession. Well, Samuel was very argumentative about that, but God said, Samuel, no, nah, it's okay. It's okay. Let them have one. In fact, I'm going to pluck somebody out specially anointed to be that king. We'll get to that in just a minute. But they were expecting a warrior Messiah. Now, mind you, there is nowhere in Scripture that would tell them to expect that type of Messiah. Abs nowhere. All the prophecies speak to exactly what the Messiah will be like and what he will do. A Messiah was required not to free the Jews, but to free mankind and get them back into a right relationship with God. Just like today, they were thinking about the world. How many places, I have never even tried to count them up, how many places in Scripture are we told not to worry about the world, not to be of the world, we are just passing through. Don't get bogged down in all this. But we do. Over and over and over again. To where the entire Old Testament 
had become to the Jews an expectation of something worldly. Where what brought about the whole need of redemption? Adam and Eve, disobedience from God, being kicked out of the garden. What is sin? What is sin? Is it sex? Is it drugs? Is it too many shoes in your closet? Sin is disobedience to God. Every sin. Now, we like to categorize them as sexual sins, as financial sins, as sins of the heart, sins of the mind, sins of omission, sins of commission. No, all of them are directly disobedience to God. And what the Jews needed and what the Old Testament prophets talked about was a way to get humankind into a right relationship with God. That's what the whole Bible is about. All of it. It's the story. But the Jews, like we today, twisted it into something that they wanted. Something they desired. That's why they were so messed up about John the Baptist and Jesus. Because it was entirely backwards from what they expected and what they wanted. When we pray for healing, for example, and instead of healing, the person dies, how do we treat that? Because the fact of the matter is, we take the Bible, the Bible says, whatever you pray for, I'll give you. And then we pray for... Um, Dave has cancer and he's on death's door and hopefully my friends are praying hard that this and I die I'm gone not even a hope not even a, a, a wink of assistance coming in the way that's a prayer that wasn't answered and that's a legitimate question but we treat this the same way we treat what Scripture says about answered prayer. Scripture says, whatever you ask in my name, whatever you ask in my will, I will give you. The reason the answer sometimes is no is because our prayers are not in the will of God. They're in our will or our desire what we want it's the same thing here the same thing that happened here for hundreds of years they were expecting this warrior king and now John the long expected prophet out of the desert for 400 years is telling them I'm sending you a lamb and you guys are unclean and you ain't ready for it that's why they were so confused and so messed up. Now, John also describes the Holy Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he, and he, capital He, means the Holy Spirit, remained upon him. And this one would baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. This fact of the Holy Spirit, depending on Jesus, is important in its own right. It meant, and this is so much controversy from the early church all the way on, this meant that the work of Jesus was not done by a thinly disguised deity in a human nature, but that the human Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit to fulfill the mission of Messiah. Otherwise, there would have been no need for the Holy Spirit to come down and alight on him. None. None whatsoever. Just like if all of this that we're talking about didn't have a purpose, it wouldn't have happened.
now to the baptism of Jesus himself. That's a whole lot of background to get to where we were going to be. First of all, it's important because it marked he was anointed, number one, by the Holy Spirit to begin his ministry. And number two, it marked the beginning of his ministry. That's when it started. Contrary to some of the apocryphal books that were written, and we talked about the past couple of weeks, of the child Jesus making clay birds and such and breathing life into them, that's all nonsense. And the early church knew it to be nonsense. It was, if I might call it so, not to be vulgar, but it was his ordination. It was the beginning or the firing of the starting pistol that your ministry is starting. You are now the Messiah completing your work. The job has started. At his baptism, uh, baptism, he was anointed to fulfill the mission expressed in Isaiah 61, uh, which says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now remember, this is written in Isaiah. Hundreds of years, a thousand years before this is happening. Look at what he says the Messiah is going to be. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to pro proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's Isaiah 61, uh, verses 1 and halfway through verse 2. Does that sound like a warrior messiah to you? Let, let me tell you something. There is no general in the world, despite the necessity of the battle that has ever brought anything but misery to the poor. The poor are typically the ones that get trampled in battle. Collateral damage it's called today. No warrior king is going to bring tidings to the poor or heal the brokenhearted. Generals create broken hearts. Now, I can guarantee you, and my father was a veteran um, of the Second World War, there was a great deal of excitement on VE Day. There was a great deal of excitement on BJ Day. But I guarantee you there are a lot of people with broken hearts all over the world. Broken hearts that still had it mended in some cases. Generals, those types of kings, do not heal broken hearts. Isaiah is talking about the Messiah as he will be. When Jesus began to minister by preaching in the synagogue of Nazareth, he quoted this text and then told the listening congregation that today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And they didn't listen to him. You, if, if nothing else, you'd have thought that they'd throw rocks at him if they didn't believe him. But you, you don't hear of anything happening. And I suspect that would be the case if Jesus walked into a lot of churches today. Now, maybe if he were wearing a long robe and had long hair like you see in the pictures, that would be one thing. Although, my guess is we probably think you're an imposter. No one comes to church looking like that. We'd probably do the same thing or have to put him on a polygraph and ask a bunch of questions to make sure he's legit. In Matthew, we're told that when Jesus sought to be baptized by John, that John had initially refused him, telling Jesus that Jesus should baptize him. And this is the crux of the issue. John knew clearly that Jesus had no need to be cleansed. Remember, what was Jesus, what was John calling the people to do? 
you're dirty, you need to be cleansed, you need to repent, you need to get ready because he's here. Well, now he's here. If you didn't listen to me yesterday, you're kind of late. Okay? John knew that Jesus didn't need to be cleansed. He understood thoroughly who Jesus was. He didn't thoroughly understand his mission. But Jesus asked John to trust him for now and baptize him because by doing so, Jesus could fulfill all righteousness. Put that in the back of your minds. He could fulfill all righteousness. This small line of text, which comes out of Matthew 3, chapter 3, verse 15. This small line of text speaks more than the rest of the Bible about the work of Jesus Christ, his life, and the events we're told of, and the importance of them. Those few words tell us exactly why he had to come and live his life prior to to the arrest and crucifixion. It shows that he was sent to fulfill all righteousness. He did not come fundamentally to free us. That was a byproduct to our eternal gratitude. He came to fulfill all righteousness. The people were being required to be baptized and if the people were required to be baptized to demonstrate repentance to be righteous then Jesus had to do that not that he needed it personally but to fulfill the required righteousness he had to follow suit in other words the people had all these 600 laws to obey. The Ten Commandments to obey. That was what made you righteous and was humanly impossible to do. But Jesus had to do that. He came to fulfill all of those things that people cannot or could not fulfill. It was that that made him or qualified him to be the lamb without blemish. To be without blemish means that he satisfied all those requirements in his life. That's why he had to come. That's why he had to be here and not just get crucified in a sense. The people were required to fulfill the Ten Commandments. Jesus had to adhere to the whole law of God because the redemption he brought to mankind was not accomplished simply by the cross. Now that sounds blasphemous to many people. You, the cross would not have ascribed righteousness to us. When God looks at us, as unbelievable as this is, he sees the face of Christ. Why does he see the face of Christ when he looks at us? Because Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. He obeyed every single law that was required. And by his crucifixion and resurrection, he was able to ascribe that righteousness to us. I don't know why he would do that. Don't know how. But from before, before time began, the covenant of redemption, that was the agreement. That's what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit agreed to do. Because they knew we would need it. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that who should ever... Don't you sometimes come to take that verse for granted, if you're honest? But when you think about what we've talked about this morning, doesn't it give it new meaning? 
God so loved the world even before it was created that he knew this was going to be necessary to get us back. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Now this is a, a big theological question, but it, what I'm thinking of in our own lives, it, it involves back to free will. And I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of description and thought and theological thought of that, but the free will is very huge. We, and, and we do not have the time to discuss the problem of free will, free will. Uh, we just don't. And we'll save that for another day. But you're absolutely right. We could we could speak for weeks on the views of free will. Um, no, I know what you're trying to do, Bill. Brett. No, no, I just and. You're right, um, and it, I gotta leave that, because if I get down that rabbit trail, we're gonna stay there for a couple of months. Um, see, you distract me. Um, okay, he had to be the unblemished lamb. We distinguish in theology two types of obedience in Jesus. When you're talking about Jesus being obedient there are two types theologically. Now, I know that the, the average Christian, with all due respect, really doesn't care that much about getting deep into theology. And I get that. Um, I sometimes think I have to be about half crazy to do it myself. But, well, I, oh, yeah. Um, but we distinguish two types of obedience, passive and active. Now, passive obedience is demonstrated in Christ's willingness to die, his willingness to suffer, his willingness to do what he had to do as the Messiah. He passively received the curse on the cross. His active obedience is seen in his entire life. The actions of his life that he, like John, dedicated solely to obey the law of God, thereby qualifying himself as the one who could hang on the cross, the one who could redeem us. That was his agreed upon part of the covenant of redemption that was determined long before the universe was created. But he had to do that. Otherwise, there would have been no righteousness when Christ ascended to the right hand of God to ascribe to us. We would still be unrighteous. Does that make sense? Now, that God or Jesus, by fulfilling all righteousness, was able to be righteousness for us? What if he'd come and he'd failed? What if he'd broken the law? Would he be righteous? No. Where would he get his righteousness from? Well, God would have to find out a to way to. To be righteous, you had to obey the law. So Jesus had to come down and fulfill that. And you, anybody here think I'm being blasphemous right now? Does this make sense? Do you follow what, what Jesus had to do and why it was important? Why would he come down and live materially this miserable existence if he didn't have to? Why would he be scourged? Why would he be spit upon? Why would he be ignored and turned away? if he did not have to do that to fulfill his mission as the Messiah. John the Baptist did not understand all that Jesus had to do and would have to go through. But I guarantee you he understands it now where he is. Any questions, comments, concerns? 
Well, thank you. I know that's a lot, and you, you, it really takes some wrapping your head around. Um, but that's not the end of the story. We'll have something else to discuss next week. Okay. Thanks, oh, Bill, would you lead us in, in prayer to close, please? Father, thank you so much for your son. Uh, those of us that seek your divine understanding, Father, I pray that you will bless us uh, as we seek your will, Father. Help us to continue in our own lives, seek that will, and share that will and love for our family, our friends, Father. Thank you for what you do for us. Be with our church, your church, Father, and help us to have the commitment, uh, the uh, free will that is needed that you show us the love that you have for us. Be with our families. Thank you for Dave and Jean and what they mean to this church. Thank you for Brother Bob as he fills the interim position. And be with our future coming pastor, Father, that uh, he will be a light also for this community and our church this church will be invited to this community. Thank you for what you do for us. Thank you for the power of prayer. Be with our families. 